It is really nice to be here. Uh, it is still home for me. I was, uh, had a very uh, good career here for five and a half years and uh, very awesome colleagues, so a uh, great experience. I introduced myself in our Blackfoot language. My name is uh, Nato Satki, which in our language means sun woman. Uh, as I was teaching uh, many years ago, uh, Blackfoot, uh, one of the books that we used was uh, Charcoal's World. And in that book, uh, I, I had come across the information because a lot of our uh, traditions and cultures went, were hidden because they had to be protected. And so not very many people have that easy access to what the culture can be at times. So here I was reading about our culture and about names. Names are actually um, possessions to be proud of. And, uh, and so as a, as a young baby, a baby, um, I always had these, these cheeks. And uh, my grandfather called me Buckski. And uh, my older cousins would always tease me, and they, when I when we go visit, and they'd say Buxky, Buxky, and that would mean my my big cheeks. When I was in grade seven, I ran for Indian Princess uh, at at the school I was at, St. Mary's, now known as Kainai, and uh, we had an Indian Awareness Week at our Indian school, <laughs> and so I I won. And that winter afterwards, we had to live with our grandparents in the more populated area because our road was completely closed. We couldn't go home. So we had lived with them for uh, almost a month. And in that time, um, my grandfather woke up one morning and he had a very uh, a bad dream and he was going to paint our faces, which was their practice. And my mother reminded him, she said, um, Dad, remember uh, Annette, one Indian princess, and she still has her baby name. Maybe now is the time to give her her uh, adult name. So my grandfather named me Miatnistikitstekyaki that morning. It wasn't a public thing. So, um, and then years later, when I left here and I went home, I then uh, had the privilege of obtaining my master's degree. And my co-worker then said, and I had been talking about taking my grandmother's name, and I talked to my uncle, and it was okay. Um, I was actually uh, one of the Gipi Dapu uh, the, the uh, uh, old people child, if you were to translate into that into English, old people child. And I had just taken her name. I took her name, and there was a ceremony with all the students, and my name was Biaki. And, uh, and then about two years after that, um, we started a walking club. Every morning we walk at the high school. And in, in our walking, uh, some mornings in, in the fall, in the spring, we walk outside. And in the spring, uh, one of my students, who is an extraordinary, profound student, and that means that they have um, a, a severe um, physical or cognitive delay, and so um, actually disability. And, but he, he, he was a, a really nice character, uh, very helpful, um, and, and his, his delay was more physical than it was cognitive. And so we were walking one morning, and he comes to me, and he's walking with me, and he says, uh, uh, Annette, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give you a Blackfoot name. And I was like, uh, I just took my name, and I really like my grandma's name. I really wanted that. I was very close to my grandmother. And then I remembered, and I thought this was a gift. So he told me, I said, okay, I'll, I'll accept the name. And he said, and that today your name is Nadu Saki. And he pushed me, and that's the ceremony. And he pushed me, and he said, and that it's because you bring brightness to our school. And so that, that means very much to me today. Um, so, th so the journey that I kind of wanted to share, um, with you is maybe going to be a bit convoluted, a bit much, but I, I hope that at some point it, it does synthesize within you that it's all connected. We are all connected. All of our concepts, everything that we do as educators, it's all connected. When I, when I went home after teaching here for five and a half years, I went home and 
it was evident that we didn't always believe that all students could learn. And so in the years that we've been there, that has been one of the things that we've had to focus on was all students can learn. The vision that I always had when I went home because I saw that here was great leadership in a leader, a good leader doesn't have followers. A good leader has other great leaders. That is our team. That is the only way that we can survive and be sustainable. And so that is the journey that I embarked on was to create great leaders. And then the process becoming a leader myself. This summer, I had the opportunity to attend the Harvard Graduate School of Education for a one week leadership course and it was called uh, Leadership and Evolving Vision. And when I first got there, I was like, okay, I could do this. I was still very much uh, shake, shaken that I was able to go. And then um, probably uh, not quite midway through or midway through, I had a meltdown. I thought, what am I doing here? Uh, I, I, I shouldn't be here. I was amongst 170 uh, school leaders, district leaders, who were very much uh, about standardized tests. They came from places, private schools where their students are going to Ivy League schools, and that's just the way it is. Um, they have all these uh, demands on them as principals, as school leaders, to, to perform. And so everyone under them has to perform. And I'm thinking, I'm just from a little First Nations Reserve in Little Canada, and what am I doing here? And so I had a meltdown. I remember walking, uh, walking out that day, and my husband came with me, and, uh, and I, I just melted down. I had a good cry, and I said, what am I doing here? I had a good rest, though, and the next morning I went back, and I felt much stronger. And I had heard Howard Gardner talk about leadership. And he talked about how today's leaders are more based on popularity rather than values. And we can see that in the United States, and he was alluding to that very much. Um, and so that, that really uh, had an impact on what I was thinking while I was there. And uh, so the last morning, we had a, a session, and we were just breaking down what education was, and the question that came forth was, what is education to you? And it was other leaders talking about what education meant and you know, getting kids to the Ivy Leagues. And in, in, in a moment, I thought, and I shared it, education to me is life and death for my students. If they are not educated, their opportunity to live a life of fulfillment, of self-fulfillment, is depleted. If they do not know how to read, they do not know how to write, they do not know how to problem solve, they do not see patterns, they don't know how, what sequences are, they will not have a life filled with joy, a life filled with passion. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong here. Um, so I shared that and I, I talked about residential schools. We all know about them. But then I also then had that moment of clarity when we look at the murdered and missing indigenous women, when if we were to actually study all of those women, how many of them had an education? And if they had an education, would they be one of the statistics? And so with that, um, in, in all of that, the last 15 years of my career came to that one moment. And I realized that that's what the work that I was doing, that we were doing at Kainai, was all about that. Am I saying that every one of our students leaves with an education? No. 
but I am seeing that more of our students are leaving with an education. More of our students are leaving with hope. More of our students are leaving with uh, the ability to walk at least in one world. And one day they'll be able to walk in two worlds. I, I had, uh, when I was at uh, Catholic Central, um, the, the students for uh, leadership were not voted for. It was about the students that wanted to be part of leadership and they were welcomed. When I went home, uh, students who wanted to be leaders, then we had elections and we had voting and then it became about popularity. And probably one of my first experiences as principal was a very um, negative experience. And, and so from that moment, I said, we're not going to have voting anymore, any student that wants to be a leader. Last year, I had a, a grade 10 student come and say, we want a student council. We want to have dances, and we want to do this, and we want to do that. And I really had to think about it. It shook me up a little bit. One, I was very, very excited to hear a student say that to me, that they had the courage to come into my office and say this to me. Two, it kind of shook up that belief of value versus popularity. And I did have to state what I, what I thought, and she wasn't very happy about it. And then probably not even a week later, there were some issues that happened in the family, and she had poor attendance after that. But she came back, and she is back with us, and she is a leader, and that's what I shared with her. I said, everyone here is a leader, teachers, students. Every day that you come to school and you model that healthy behavior, you're a leader. And we have many opportunities for you to do that. And so this year she took part in the program and I could see she understands. And I guess for me it has always been about patience. Just because I think it and know it and believe it doesn't mean that everyone around me is going to think it and know it and believe it. It's going to take time and experience. And, and that has been the case with the work that we have done with the teachers. The teachers, when I first came, were very much um, led for professional development. They, they didn't like it, but they did it. Today, I believe that the teachers at, at Kainai High School have that voice to say, this is what I want to do for my professional development. This is what will help me become a better teacher. We did a lot of work with one of the former principals that I worked with, and our first three years was on teacher efficacy. Are we effective? Are we making a difference in our students' lives? And so that has really built the foundation on what we do today. Literacy is the ability to communicate our thoughts and our ideas. Numeracy is more than computation. It's problem solving. It's understanding patterns, sequences, and it's understanding relationships. And so when I was thinking about coming here today and sharing with you, I thought about, and I'm sure you already know this, you're, you're from Holy Spirit, spiritual literacy, spiritual numeracy. And I think that that's really what I have to share with you about who I am. I've always been from a young child, uh, coming from two sets of grandparents that prayed every day in every way, um, very spiritual. I didn't have my grandparents say one set was Catholic and one set was uh, very much into the native spirituality. I never had them say, well, that's not God, this is God. There's only, there's two different gods you can't play never, ever, ever, ever was implied. And so I had the great, great privilege to grow up that way, and today I believe that. So however you communicate with a higher power, to me, is spirituality. And so when I look at spiritual literacy, it is about that, being able to communicate our humanness and everything that comes with that, and giving hope, providing hope, and then changing and taking that into the numeracy aspect. The spiritual numeracy to me is then problem solving in a very humanistic way. I just want to share a little story about 
we, we've had many, many struggles. As you know, the blood reserve has um, been very much in the news when it comes to fentanyl addiction. And last month, early this month, we had four young men who were caught in our washroom. Uh, they had fentanyl. They were um, breaking it into a powder, and they were snorting it. And, and what do you do when they talk about the, the uh, problem solving and talk about life and death? What do you do? What would you do when you know that you have, a st you have students and you send them back into the community, but you don't have the supports in your own building? What do you do? I, I can tell you what we did, but I don't want to. I want you to think about that. What would you do if you were the leader of that school, trying to make these, trying to bring about this cultural shift? We were also told by an educator, we have the great opportunity to not only change the culture of our school, but to change the culture of Kainai. When that responsibility is on you every day, every moment of the day, what would you do? So thank you for this. Thank you for taking the time to come and listen to me. I'm very humbled by you being here, and uh, I appreciate that. And thank you, Darcy, for inviting me to come, to come home. Thank you. Thank Annette now. I'll just turn this mic off for a moment. Or not. There we go. Thank you so much, Annette, for coming to share your story with us here. And I'm going to present Annette with a little token of our appreciation for being here with us today. Thank you. 